Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Margaret Fontana Media Podcast Show. And I am on a Zoom today as we're starting our expert series for the next couple of months. We did an expert series a few months back and um, the feedback was overwhelming. We had everyone from media, film, TV, fashion. And today I want to welcome someone um, who I, you know, follow online as well, who we we cross paths constantly. She's in the media world. And I'd like to welcome our good friend, Laura. Hi, Laura. Hi, Margaret. Thank you so much for having me here. Like you said, we've crossed paths so many times. And I'm excited that we actually get to connect like this right now. Yeah. And you know, I was going to say your full name. And then I thought to myself, let me have Laura actually pronunciate her last name properly, because I'm sure everyone always probably mispronounce pronounces the the ch and the the phonetics yeah it's a, it's it's not a tricky last name but it's a tricky last name i say it laura chavez oh uh, yeah i say chavez but i'm not even remotely offended when people say chavez or get it wrong as long right. as you know they're open to me saying like oh i actually say chavez but i chavez. appreciate you yeah i appreciate you taking a stab at it so yeah <laughs> chavez <laughs> i love it so welcome and I wanted to kind of start this interview talking about who Laura Chavez is and what Laura does um, and just kind of, you know, really be able to give a little bit of context around film and media and all the different wonderful things that you're doing. And then we'll talk about all the different projects you've worked on and the relationship to digital media and how that relates to what's happening with this fast forward in digital right now. So tell me a little bit about who you are and how you got started in film and media and TV. Cause it's like kind of this umbrella that you're in. Yeah, it's, um, I pride myself in having a very diverse background. Um, I started, uh, I live in Chicago uh, dominantly. I actually split my time between Chicago and Washington DC for the most part, um, but I am currently in Chicago and I went to school up here at Loyola University with a communications and a political science major. Uh, with the full intent of being a lawyer. And then I took one internship at uh, WMAQ, which is the NBC affiliate. And I was like, totally transformed. I was like, I love production. I love television. I love content development. I love all of it. So I abandoned pre-law and decided to double down on media. Uh, After that, I got my first job in Peoria, Illinois, just three hours south of where I am right now. Uh, I was an on-air reporter and weekend producer, which, wow. yeah, which was kind of fun and actually gave a lot. But I can see that. I can see that about you. You have, you have like that journalistic vibe to you. Well, thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah. Oh, I know yeah. Some, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it actually was a great experience because it taught me both sides of the camera. Uh, You know, I had to shoot a lot of my own stuff because it's a smaller market. So I got to get my hands on a camera, got to do my own editing, but I also got to, you know, experience what it is to be saying a sentence with someone else saying something in your ear. So it was a really good experience. And then from there, I had a big jump in market all the way up to Washington, D.C., where I was there for about 10 years. And it was really just wonderful. Uh, While I was there, I was producing exclusively. Um, I decided on air wasn't necessarily where I wanted to be. Um, But I got to not only do news, but I was also the creator of the first lifestyle talk show that is exclusively for the uh, DMV, as it's called, the District, Maryland and Virginia area, where I got to highlight a lot of uh, issues for women, including stuff that spanned from like the everyday styling tips and makeup, but also to like um, breast cancer research and eating disorders and taking kind of a deeper dive into and wage discrimination in taking a deeper dive into what's actually like happening in the world, specifically with the point of from the point of view and for the point of view of a woman. Wow. Uh, after that, um, I decided to take a stab at getting out of news, which was a big jump. And I got a job at Red Arrow Industries in Knoxville, Tennessee. They are a great company and they taught me a lot. I was there for a couple of years. And then after that, I decided I wanted to be a little bit closer to family and moved back to Chicago where I am now at Exit 19 as the executive producer and one of the partners there. And we've got lots of fun things going on and I've had a blast ever since. Wow. So, yeah. so tell me about Exit 19. So Exit 19 is what would you 
uh, classify it as a production company or like a multimedia? What, what do you guys focus on? So we call ourselves a, a small boutique production agency. So with that, it essentially means that we are a pretty small group. We don't have, you know, hundreds of employees or anything like that. We do a lot of stuff with contract workers as well, um, because that's kind of where we started in all honesty, like we went through a phrase when we were just kind of trying to get to know, my partner's name is Jeremy, but when we were trying to get to know each other, where we were both contracting, you know, like I would get a gig and be like, I have a great DP for you. And he would get a gig and he would say, I have a great producer for you. And so after that, uh, we decided, you know, it was, it was an appropriate space. And we have a lot of really awesome clients. We have the luxury of not necessarily being super selective, but doing things that we really are passionate about. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned earlier that uh, the show I created, it was Let's Talk Live in Washington, DC. It was geared towards women and empowering women in every space we could. So we decided like, what are the causes that we wanna work with for nonprofits? We do still do corporate work, which pays a lot of the bills, you know? I mean, yeah. everyone is happy to do a, a tutorial on HR software, but at the end of the day, it's not going to be, it's not necessarily going to be the thing where you go to bed and you're like, man, I made the world a better place. It's two different, it's two different animals. You know, it's like, I, I work in the corporate world too. And, and, you know, I'm usually the person working with the product, the video production teams to say like, you know, we have to figure out a way to put a story together that makes sense for a consumer. And it's, it's not always the sexiest thing, but I will tell you that over the years, you know, I've had um, junior level production people and camera people that, you know, have learned really it's, it's an amazing like foundation to work in corporate production, video production, because it really gives you a foundation to have a storyboard, how to work with the people who, you know, in, on a film set, we'd call them difficult people, but in a corporate setting, you're like, those are, those are the people paying the bills. It's like the, the executives. So there's always like these similarities, but I, but to your point, you know, there's, there's a good, um, great, great way to pay the bills. I, exactly. You know, but yeah. it's, it's quality, you learn a lot of those pieces in that area. So I hear what you're saying on that. Yeah. And um, to kind of feed off of that uh, idea of like a really solid foundation, um, I think that for all the like newcomers who want to get into film, who want to get into television, mm -hmm. who want to get into this space of yeah. production, it is so important to make sure you learn your craft at as many levels as possible. Because I learned so much stuff from news in how to tell a story and how to tell a story quickly and the importance of deadlines and you know that kind of stuff. Then I went into this creative space with Red Arrow and I was able to really kind of have fun and use creative new shots and incorporate more graphics. And throughout my career, I've found that I'm constantly building more and more and more and more and yeah. more, which is a really great feeling. And it's something that I was able to do because I had this foundation where I learned to shoot. I learned to edit. I learned what it was like being on the front of the camera. And I learned what it was like in a control room and how to make things interesting because story right. is really the biggest part, in my opinion, story is the heart of production. Absolutely. So just backtracking, you said you went to Loyola. Is that what you said? Okay. Yes. So did you take um, like a film production? Was that your major in college? So uh, I had a double major of communications and political science. I always told myself that I was going to be like a Supreme Court justice. So I wanted to be able to communicate and I wanted to know the value of words, which I thought was really important in the communication space. But I also needed the like background and the history and the general knowledge of civics that political science would offer. So I had those two as my major. And I just dove in head first. I'm still a political animal. I, I watch it. I consume it. I, you know, I, yeah. I always have even the boring stuff like budget talks. I just love it. So yeah. I'm, well, and plus you're in Washington, D.C. as part of your other like, you know, life. You're in Chicago and D.C. So I think it almost lends. That's why I said you have like a journalistic vibe because it's almost like you can't help it. I mean, I, th I think it's incredible. I watched the inauguration yesterday and I and it's so hard to watch TV because I'm always thinking about like the production side of it. You know, I'm thinking, oh, man, they're switching over or you see like the reporter quickly putting thoughts together. And then she's like, you know, they throw over to some poor journalists off to the side and she's like 
you know, putting it so eloquently together, but it's, it's so fascinating, you know, and, and so you mentioned an internship and I think a lot of times um, in a lot of different conversations I've had with different um, experts, people always ask like, how do I get into the business or how do I get into TV? How do I get into production? And how would you say your internship played a role in what you're doing now? I know you mentioned a little bit about it, but do you think that if you didn't take that internship, you probably wouldn't be where you are? 100%. Um, So my biggest tip, and I give this to every college kid who I talk to, every high school kid, take the internship that no one wants. In your field, take the internship that nobody wants. What I did was I actually, I interned with WMAQ and WBBM. They are the CBS and the NBC O&O affiliates here in Chicago. But I interned for the morning shift. So my hours were like 1.30 in the morning until 8.30 in the morning. No college kid wants to be, you know, writing a ticker or, you know, doing anything other than sleeping or coming home from a bar for the most part at those hours. But I took those internships and because of it, I had such an amazing experience. The crew was eager to get me involved. I actually put together my first uh, reporter reel with several of the reporters here at WMAQ because they were excited to take me in the field. They were excited to show me the ropes. The the, uh, photographers were excited to get me in front of the camera. They sent me into interviews that the daytime interns and the evening interns didn't get access to because I was willing to take as, you know, as a colloquialism that I've heard in the voice, I was willing to take the suck early and I've been able to just totally twist it. And I'm actually really good friends with some of the people still at the station. And one of them is my mentor. His name is Chris Selfridge and he's the executive producer over at BBM still. And he's amazing, but he was one of the guys that was like, hey, if you wanna know what it feels like to anchor, grab that IFB. It's one of our spares, hop in. I'll I'll let you see what it feels like. See what it feels like to read off a prompter. It's and- so important to have, um, I would also say it's an important part to have a mentor. You mentioned a mentor and, you know, it sounds like without that one supportive person to really kind of like always give you the permission to kind of like, here, just try it here, see what happens. Don't you think that's so important is just to have someone, if you're, if you're up and coming, or if you're looking to get into the industry, like the mentor is so pivotal to your mindset and your confidence. I think it is, it's one of the most important Uh, positions that you can take or that you can be to someone else because it gives them almost like a permission to be vulnerable because the thing is like in my case at least like it's scary to get in front of a camera but I had all of these people especially you know people like Chris and Curtis who were like you know what no try it It, there's no harm in trying and just having that brave having someone else tell me that it was going to be okay that like no one was going to laugh no one and if they were laughing. I would probably be laughing too, because something would have happened. It was one of the biggest things that a mentor can do is create a safe environment. I love that. And I was very lucky that every mentor I've had has created a really safe environment for me to try, for me to experiment, for me to fail. And I think that's another really important thing that you can do early on in your career and throughout your, I'm still failing. And it feels great every time it happens because I know I'm one step closer to success. Wow. I love that. So as part of a lot of your bios, you, you write, um, story lover and, and, and before you, you said a lot about storytelling and I think an important part of, and these are things that like I touch on, you know, in, in a lot of the work I do, you know, I'm always like dropping these topics, um, because it's just, there's so many parts, there's so many moving parts to media, to telling a story, to putting a film together, putting a video together. What are your thoughts on, stories and putting a good story together and and really getting like all of your all of your pieces together in order to produce that that you know that unicorn work that you're looking to do because I mean so many people want to get to that but I think telling a story and writing can be can be challenging oh absolutely it is one of the hardest things to do especially as you get to know the story because you will fall in love You will fall in love with your work and it is the hardest thing to say, oh, I really got this great soundbite. It's beautiful. The person I was interviewing was so eloquent, but it doesn't fit. 
and it hurts to say it doesn't fit, get or get rid of it, cut it. But having that moment where you actually do just kind of boil down the story to what's important is magical. One of the things that, um, for all of our clients at the beginning of a project, we send something called an exploration sheet to them, mm -hmm. which I think has truly revolutionized the way that we do storytelling to make sure that we're conveying what our clients want to do, what they want to feel. And some of the questions are very, and we always say like, answer this in two sent. Each question gets two sentences or less. Uh, some clients bend the rules by making really long sentences, but you know, we always want to try and condense it down. But a lot of the questions are like really obvious ones like, oh, well, what do you want to do with this? But at the, one of the questions that I always really love and I'm so happy that we put it on there is how do you want the viewer to feel at the end? Oh, it I is like that. It's such an important question that people forget yeah. about because especially when you're dealing with clients who, you know, yeah, the HR software stuff isn't super exciting, but how do you want the person watching to feel at the end of it? Do you want them to feel overwhelmed? No, you don't want that. You want them to feel like this is doable, right? This is okay. Like this is not going to take that long. You want to give them a sense of ease. So I think having those talks with clients and really helps boil down the story that they want to tell. And it helps us tell the story we want to tell, because that's also really important. If you're going to put something out into the world, you need to be proud of it. Yeah. There are levels of pride to all of the projects we've done. Some of them I'm like, oh, that was such a beautiful video. I encourage everyone to go watch the 60th anniversary gala video for child help. It was, it, it made several people cry, yeah. including myself. And there are other videos that I'm like, you know what? I'm proud of that, but it's not that other video. Yeah. So you always want to try and make sure that the story that you're telling is the story you're proud of, but also a story that your client's going to be proud of, that you're making sure that mm -hmm. the message is getting across in the best way possible. Right. So, and then as we're talking about storytelling and like really producing these different video pieces, and I'm sure a lot of your clients also are asking, you know, Hey, Laura, how do we take this video? And, you know, we really want to get the most out of our platforms, maybe even our social media platforms or our website, you know, what kinds of conversations are you having to talk about how to adapt you know, like the traditional beautiful video or film into, let's say, the digital spaces? Absolutely. I'd say the kind of conversations we're having are usually difficult. They're difficult conversations because while you have also fallen in love with the footage and the sound bites, they have too. So they don't necessarily understand that if you're doing a, a 15 minute video, a five minute video, or something like that, that doesn't have necessarily a place in on Instagram, on TikTok, on Snapchat, on Facebook, you know, that kind of thing. I think knowing and have, and I'm a huge proponent of knowing your craft and knowing your stats. Mm -hmm. I think knowing your stats is one of the most important things you can do, especially when you're talking with a client, because if you go to them and say like, Hey, you've got a great five minute video. This is awesome. This will play on Facebook, mm -hmm. on Facebook, people, you knowing your demographic, you know, that it's now skewing a little bit older. People are willing to invest time on Facebook. If you're on Instagram, you have maybe a one to two second scroll to catch their eye. You don't want to play a five minute video. You want to play something that fits in their Instagram stories, or you need to double down on an IG TV or an IG live along those lines, knowing that information really does help put the client's mind at ease. It also helps put our mind at ease because we don't want to be putting in a lot of work, you right. know, boiling down this five minute video to 15 seconds, knowing no one's ever going to see it. We want to take that five minute video, find the 15 seconds that's powerful. That's going to get everyone else to go see the five minute video. Wow. And that is just the best piece of information you have given straight from the executive producer's mouth. Because, you know, I think to your point, yes, a lot of the conversations are difficult to say, yes, we understand it's beautiful. Yes, we understand that there's like this one part that you don't want to leave out. But a lot of times it's about kind of almost having an open mindset because, to your point, and then also to my to my expertise in digital, there's always these like 
changes inside of, you know, what the time frames are that you can actually use vertical versus horizontal. And these are real things. They're not sexy things to talk about. And it's not something like anybody from a high level wants to kind of get into because those are the weeds of, you know, the, the technical specs of, of how taking the beautiful product. And then like so a lot of times I've been in meetings where people are like, you're not chopping up my work, you know? And I'm like, I'm like, that's not, <laughs> that's not what we're doing, but it does. You're right. We're not chopping it up. We're maximizing its viewability. Yeah. And I love that. So let's jump back really quick to talk again about the projects for exit 19. I mean, I know you guys have a lot of stuff that you're probably working on that you, you can't really talk about from like, you know, like a public perspective, but um, what do you see like on the slate moving forward with all the things happening in the world and like what people are coming to you asking you to produce and, and is there like, it, those are actually three questions. It's like, you know, what are you hearing about what people want to produce? And are there, are there passion projects maybe for, for your company that you guys want to do? Yeah, there are. Um, I'll, I'll try and remember the three questions, but uh, I'm going to just kind of go through all my things. Yeah, like it's, it's yeah. more of me just like thinking yeah. and at, like it's conversational, but no worries. Exactly. Uh, yeah, so we do have a lot of repeat clients, which we're always excited to have. We have a few clients that have been with us pretty much for years, and we are just like, every, they are everything to us. We are, they are mostly nonprofits at that space, oh, and to which we are excited about that. Uh, we often work with companies like Child Help, like I mentioned, the Nora Project. We have uh, most likely a, a project coming up with We Coach, which is actually um, a company that I helped with the rebranding of it a few years ago. So go to their Instagram page, check it out. They've got a beautiful logo. The color scheme is amazing. They have been an amazing client when it comes to reshaping their social image. Um, but we also have a couple passion projects that we're excited about. There are a few projects that unfortunately are under embargo, so I can't actually talk about them. Um, but we're actually going to be dipping our toes into some original content, which is really exciting for us. We hadn't expected to get into original content for a few more years, mm -hmm. just because it is kind of a weird space. It's a weird time. Um, but we decided that, you know, no time like the present. There's uh, a couple passion projects that we think are really timely right now that will hopefully, you know, just make people smile and make the world a little bit of a better place. So we're hoping to, you know, get some traction. With those, um, we're not. We're gonna hopefully be filming those in the next or the first round of filming in the next couple of weeks, and then hopefully by spring we'll be taking something to taking something to town. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Um, and so, Laura, just to kind of like get everyone to to follow a lot of what you're doing in the different work. So, where can everyone find you online, and where can they find the company? and maybe drop like your handles so so we know of course so all of my all of my personal um socials are at producer laura that way it's easy to remember and you know people can find me pretty quickly and then i did the same for exit 19 when uh i got there uh essentially i decided we need to consolidate and make everything match it is just exit 19.tv Okay. So yeah, Ooh, if you good. that you got yeah. the dot TV, you we did. That was we smart. got the dot TV. Um, after a fair amount of research, we looked at the benefits of actually owning the dot com and the dot TV mm -hmm. and the like dot everything. And the metrics showed that dot TV was actually going to be the most cost efficient for us. So we were like, wow. let's go for it. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many like benefits to all of these newer. See, and this is part of like that technology discussion. Yeah. It just things keep changing. So Laura, I want to thank you so much. And um, Laura Chavez, executive producer, Exit 19. And um, Laura, you've been, you know, you've been amazing. This is a great conversation. I also want to, you know, ask you as, as we progress into the spring, you know, maybe join me for an Instagram live or a Facebook live this way, like maybe we could do a little bit more Q and A in real time and we can gather all of the folks in our network to, um, you know, maybe join in on our conversation. Absolutely. I would love that. I think that sounds okay. like a fun idea. All right. So we're going to continue 
I, I think we should do another couple of these like over, over the next couple of months too, just because you touched on so many different topics where I'm like, I don't know, I want to talk more about like what you said. So, and, and we're not going to be able to fit all of it right now, but um, I just want to say thank you again. And we're going to be putting this out on the Margaret Fontana media podcast show. It's going to be on YouTube and all of the social channels. So check it out. And Laura Chavez exit 19. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you.